morning, everyone. I'm, uh, <laughs> I barely made it here this morning. We've uh, had quite an epidemic sweep through the monastery this week and uh, take out several of my cohorts in a, I don't know what it was, a flu, a virus, a something or other. And uh, so much of this talk was probably put together in uh, fever dreams. <laughs> so Lord only knows where he's going to go with it, so we'll just have some fun and and go boldly forward. Uh, before I uh, launch into it, though, I kind of want to help set my mind and, and our minds, our space, uh, with um, my alternative to, to Sanskrit chanting for your benefit <laughs> and for mine. And that is to just set our minds to to uh, to go to a place of sincerity and earnestness. You know, Ramakrishna, I always say this when I start, Ramakrishna was emphatic through the gospel that the most important element of religion, of spiritual life, is uh, sincerity and earnestness of heart. And so uh, I'd like to give us a moment to, to pray uh, and to ask within ourselves for that, uh, for that sincerity of heart and that earnestness as we begin. If you're a, a, an atheist, you can certainly just simply request those things of yourself in your own space. Second to that is a request uh, for, uh, for truth. Ramakrishna, when he was uh, doing away with the things of the world and renouncing them one by one, he got down to everything except for truth. He was not able to, uh, to renounce that and tell the Lord to, take, to give up his truth. And so uh, it's my... Uh, prayer that, that this morning everything said and everything conveyed is, is done in a spirit of truth uh, uh, to build in that sincerity and that earnestness. And third, to bring in uh, one of my heroes, Jesus, in his, uh, when he answered the question, what is the greatest thing in, in, in the world? What's the most important thing in the world? And he said, uh, he said love. He said, broken into two parts, love for God and love for each other love each other as ourselves. And so it's my prayer as we start uh, to, to dig into the scriptures and to find an inspiration in, in, uh, in what they have to say, that we do so based on that spirit of love and, uh, and uh, for God and for each other, and that by our time together today, there'll be more of it between us and between the divine uh, because of our time together. So with those three prayers... We'll boldly launch forward uh, into my next personal tradition to dig into a poem of Hafiz that kind of embodies what I'm hoping to find today. And this one, oddly enough, uh, is called The Woman I Love. Hafiz writes, Because the woman I love lives inside of you, I lean as close to your body with my words as I can. And I think of you all the time, dear pilgrim, because the one I love goes with you wherever you go. Hafiz will always be near. If you sat before me, wayfarer, with your aura bright from your many charms, my lips could resist rushing to you and needing to befriend your blushing cheek. But my eyes can no longer hide the wondrous fact of who you really are. The beautiful one whom I adore has pitched his royal tent inside of you, so I will always lean my heart as close to your soul as I can. I uh, named this talk <laughs> this morning Stargate 2014, and uh, it's been brought to my attention that that was a humorous choice. I'm sorry to say that I'm enough of a nerd that uh, I didn't realize it was funny. <laughs> My idea in coming up with that topic was uh, to to uh, to do a New Year's talk, kind of a rehash of uh, where we're at and what we're about, and really what spiritual life is for us in the coming year, to kind of help us in our resolutions if we dare to make any. And uh, and so that, of course, to my mind, <laughs> instantly brought up that image of James Kirk, you know, at the end of every Star Trek episode, where he's sitting there talking to his computer, and uh, you know doing his computer log of 
of what they encountered for the day and what they learned from the day and uh, what pieces of information that, uh, that they got out of it. And so I wanted to do the same. And uh, it changed a little bit as, as the week went on, actually, as the month has gone on, really. And uh, what I wanted to do more this morning was to take a look at some of the things that Takur and, uh, and uh, Vivekananda and, uh, well, even Sister Christine and, and some others have said uh, that really paint up the ideal of spiritual life and to uh, not so much learn something new because I really don't know that I would have the ability to bring out something new, but to, to more bask in some sunlight, as it were, to kind of take a trip to the spiritual beach together and uh, just set our towels out and to be reminded of the beautiful things that inspired us to spiritual life and uh, that have kept us holding on and going forward uh, despite, uh, I would say, a lot of resistance in the world today. I spend a lot of time uh, online, probably more than I should, and uh, I, I, I see a growing trend uh, uh, and probably deservedly so from what, from what the, the things that are being said about religion and about uh, 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 religiosity in the modern world and its place. And really, it, its place is being questioned. You know, the people are really wondering, really, what is the value of it? It seems to cause a lot of division. Uh, it seems to have, uh, be tearing at the social fabric of our, of our culture and certainly of the world. Uh, many atrocities even now are being blamed on religion, though we like to make the distinction between religion and politics, nonetheless, uh, they seem somehow poisoned by each other these days. And um, that has caused me to do a lot of reflecting, especially because, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've chosen a life uh, of, of throwing all of my time into spiritual life, into religion. Uh, you know, it's affected the, <laughs> the way I dress the things I talk about, the place I live, and uh, the things that I do for my fun. And uh, uh, I'm, I, I definitely have kind of taken on the chin when I, when I hear those things question. And so I wanted to, to, to remind myself uh, what the goal is, what the point is, uh, what, what I think, forgive me for the cliche, but for saying what, what true religion is what spirituality is, you know. There's a large part of me that resists the idea of having a religion or a spiritual life that's somehow categorized and separate from anything else that you do during the day. You know, this idea that it's a practice or this idea that it's a set of beliefs or it's a place that you go, uh, I believe is a, is a, a very uh, deep misunderstanding in our, in our modern life that uh, really our spiritual life, our religion, is, is our life. That it's who we are and what we are and how we approach the world around us. And uh, what tools we use to grow from that to, uh, uh, and to reach for an ideal. For me, spiritual life is an ideal. And with that, I'm going to go into my first very long reading <laughs> where Takwar himself is telling us what this ideal is. This earth is blissful, blissful to all beings, and all beings are sweet to this earth. They all help each other, and all the sweetness is the Atman, that effulgent, immortal one who is inside this earth. Who is this sweetness? How can there be any sweetness but he? That one sweetness is manifesting itself in various ways. Whenever there is any love, Whenever there is any sweetness in any human being, either in a saint or in a sinner, either in an angel or a murderer, either in the body, the mind, or the senses, it is he. Physical enjoyments are but he. Mental enjoyments are but he. Spiritual enjoyments are but he. How can there be anything but he? How can there be 20,000 gods and devils fighting with each other? Childish dreams. Whatever is the lowest physical enjoyment is God, and the highest spiritual enjoyment is God. There is no sweetness but he. 
Thus says Yagnavalkya, when you come to that state and look upon all things with the same eye, when you see, even in a drunkard's pleasure, the drink only of that sweetness, then you have got the truth, and then alone you will know what happiness means, what peace means, what love means. And so long as toll make these vain distinctions, silly, childish, foolish supersti superstitions, all sorts of misery will come. But that immortal one, the effulgent one, he is inside the earth, it is all his sweetness, and the same sweetness is in the body. This body is the earth, as it were, and in, inside all the powers of the body, all the enjoyments of the body, is he. The eyes see, the skin touches. What are these enjoyments? That self-effulgent one who is in the body, he is the Atman. This world, so sweet to all beings, and every being so sweet to it, is but the self-effulgent. The immortal is the bliss in that world, in us. He is that bliss. He is Brahman. This air is so sweet to all beings, and all beings are so sweet to it. But he who is that self-effulgent immortal being in the air is also in this body. He is expressing himself as the life of all beings. The sun is so sweet to all beings, and all beings so sweet to this sun. He who is this self-effulgent being in the sun, we reflect him as a smaller light. What can be there that is but his reflection? He is in the body, and it is his reflection which makes us see the light. This moon is so sweet to all, and everyone who is so sweet to the moon, but that self-effulgent and immortal one who is the very soul of that moon, he is in us, expressing himself as mind. This lightning is so beautiful. Everyone is so sweet to the lightning. But the self-effulgent and immortal one is the soul of this very lightning and is also in us. Because all is that Brahman, that Atman, the Self, the King of all beings. This is religion. This is the ideal that, that Thakur presents to us, puts forward to us. It's the only ideal, really, that can manage as a world, you know, that can actually take us forward and actually can bring us into to, to a place that all of us know is possible. You know, we try to create it in our families. We try to create it amongst our friends. You know, every time we go out uh, dancing together or go out to the club together or do whatever, we're, we're always trying to create at least a small circle of that perfection, you know, that acceptance of one another, that joy between one another, that, uh, that happiness, you know, that, that oneness, that trust. We're always trying to create this oneness, this sense of being together, this sense of being fully accepted and fully accepting, you know. The motive behind most of the drugs that we take are to lower that barrier of ego, you know, to lower down that sense of fear, to overcome that sense of inhibition, you know, that, that sense of insecurity, that, that, you know, that, that inappropriateness, that, that, that judgment. Almost everything that we play with in this world is simply that simply trying to recreate that which we know to be true, that which we understand and which we believe and which we long for to be true. That is religion. That's the goal of our spiritual life. So what is it that blocks us if all of us are doing the same thing in every church, in every mosque this morning, not even the mosques, in the temple of Cantors down on Fairfax Street, you know, the same thing, the same practice is being had, the same, the same thing is being worked on, you know. Every new lover waking up this morning and going out for their breakfast for the first time, hoping to rekindle and to maintain that sense of oneness, that, that touch of the divine that they thought they experienced for just a brief moment, you know. In every place, everywhere this morning, we're all worshiping together, whether it's in a church or on the street, all of us trying to touch that divinity to find that divinity, to be reminded of that divinity. Well, what is it that blocks us? 
what is it that's keeping us from coming to that? What is it that's, that's causing the fights? And what is it that's going to cause that breakfast to break up and never happen again, you know? What is it that, that's going to alienate that group of friends last night or that eventually brings, you know, lovers apart? What is that? Vivekananda says, expression is necessarily degeneration because spirit can only be expressed by the letter. And as St. Paul says, the letter kills. Life cannot be in the letter, which is only a reflection. Yet principle must be clothed in matter to be known. We lose sight of the real in the covering and come to consider that as the real instead of being a symbol of the real. This is an almost universal mistake. <clears throat> we find that... that Instead of, instead of understanding that in our, in our times together, in our breakfasts together, you know, in our time outs together, in our walks together, in our marriages, in our families, we forget that all of those are merely symbols of the oneness that is the fact behind them. And we begin to think that it's those things that generate that oneness. Instead of understanding that all of the satisfaction that we've ever had in our life from any source has been merely that love that is within us being reflected back to us. We forget that and believe that that love, the source of that love, the source of that satisfaction is the thing itself, lies in the mirror and not in the object being reflected in the mirror. Vivekananda says when he talks about this, or when St. Paul talks about this idea that, that spirit uh, can only be expressed by the letter, he means by the symbol, by the language. You know, I, you do an experiment and <laughs> think, of, think of something that, uh, you know, the most beautiful sound you can think of. You can just close your eyes and you just think, what's the most beautiful sound I can think of? And then somebody says, okay, sing it. <laughs> You know, suddenly that symbology, that place of beauty that you've managed to understand, that you've seen inside, suddenly you have to come up with a symbol for it. You know, you have to come up with an expression of it. And like Vivekananda says, immediately in that expression, it's degraded. You know, you will not be able to, to express the beauty that you see in your mind, you know, that you've heard in your mind. You know, it's one of the biggest frustrations, I think, of anybody who aspires to be an artist. You get an inspiration, and then, and then you try to, to create the symbol for that inspiration. You know, some good artists manage to do that. They manage to, t to create a symbol that takes your mind higher, you know, that brings a sense of wonder to the world around. But most of us, you know, it's a stick figure with a smirk, and, <laughs> it's, like, and it's the last one you do. You know, you're discouraged, you give up. So it's that idea. We have to understand this, uh, and not just understand, but, but be be convinced at, at a fundamental level to see, to, to experience firsthand that this love that is being reflected back to us, this unity that being reflected back to us is in fact sourced within, that it's ours already, which means we carry it with us everywhere we go at all times. There's nothing in the world necessary to bring that to you. But to do that, you have to turn that inner eye from looking out through the senses into itself, which is one of the most challenging things to do. <clears throat> and normally, when we go about doing this, sometimes, in, especially in, in, when you get these ideas at first, you know, when, when somebody first says the whole, the whole world is, uh, you know, is one, that there's a oneness in everything, that there's this uh, you know, magical unity you go around and it's easy to start kind of trying to, to act that out, you know. We, we sort of get a sense, oh yeah, of course, that's what it is, I get it, you know, that's, that's how that is. But it's done without, without, a, without a, a sense, a deeper sense of understanding, and it doesn't last. You know, I, I look in, in, I hope it's just the, <laughs> the earlier days of my spiritual life, but I fear it's probably pretty close to now also. Some of the most smug moments, the smug self-righteousness that, that, you know, spiritual life can sometimes produce in, in some unfortunate folks, <laughs> you know, where 
you just have this sense of knowing or, you know, yes, I've got that figured out. And, you know, until somebody cuts in line and takes the last piece of pizza, then, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that sense of unity is gone. You know, it's like it's, it's, it's over. Or some of the greatest acts of, of uh, selfishness, you know, that are done out of a sense of license that comes from this oneness where you assume someone else's oneness somehow serves you. In the Bhakti Sutras, it's mentioned here, uh, the, the writer Narada uh, makes a mention of, of a great danger that happens as we practice this love. He says, giving up all other refuge, the practitioner takes refuge in God alone. Scriptures are to be followed as long as one's life has not become firm, or else there is danger in doing evil in the name of liberty. This, I think, <laughs> if that matters, is one of the most uh, uh, prominent, I think, uh, slippery slopes for... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to come close to saying something so wrong as it's, it's uh, going to be irretractable. But in this idea of al alternative religions, and I may have a totally wrong misunderstanding of everybody's idea of alternative religions, so forgive me if I do. We can hash it out later, but uh, quite often, you know, in, in this idea of alternative religions or, or, or a New Age th thinking or kind of a, uh, it's, it's often done in reaction to a, to a traditional misunderstanding of our Christian backgrounds and the senses of guilt and the senses of abuse that have come from, from our mispractice of some of the ideals of Christ. And uh, we come into these new religions um, because they don't talk about sin. They don't frame the world in the sense of good and evil and, you know, the devil and, and heaven and hell. And so there's a great sense of freedom in that. You know, there's a great sense of, ah, oh, well, God got out of that one. <laughs> but a lot of times uh, that's as far as we go. You know, we kind of find a certain comfort in that, in that idea that the world is perfect as it is. You know, that if you could see it as it was, you would be able to write this paragraph where Ramakrishna says, everything in the world is helpful to one another, you know, despite what the apparent horrors that are going on in the world. You know, we, we somehow salve ourselves into sort of a, a state of a delusion, really, where we just kind of alleviate ourselves of responsibility, the idea that, oh, that's that person's karma, or that's that person's karma, or really it's fine, I just have to accept it and see it, you know. And what, but what Nard is saying here is he's saying there is a danger in doing evil in the name of liberty. As long as you have attachments, you know, as long as you can answer the question, uh, what do I want? <laughs> You've got to be very careful about what you trust from, from what you might assume is your inner guide or that inner guru. The guru is there, there's no doubt, don't get me wrong. The teacher is inside, there is that one great teacher, that one love that's inside of us being infinitely expressed. But that one light that shines in there gets reflected through many different veils and many different ideas uh, of self before it comes out, you know, before it becomes visible to the world on the outside. And uh, if that, if that uh, hasn't been carefully uh, cleaned, uh, maintained, you know, uh, I'm really trying to avoid the word purifying <laughs> because of all of its asso associations. But really purified, you know, if you haven't done the work in your spiritual life to clean up and to understand it to be, and at least increase your awareness of the different veils of attachment that sometimes pervert the pure sense of love that's emanating from inside of you, you can be led into a wrong idea of liberty. You know, for instance, you know, in, this, in the quote, the sexual revolution, this idea of liberty means, if I want to do it, I can do it. That's what it is to be free. But Vivekananda says something very different. He says, but a man to prove that he is not a machine must demonstrate that he is under the control of nothing. When you are under the control of nothing, that's when that's what liberty means, <laughs> that you can do whatever you want. You know, it's kind of a 
oxymoron at that point, but this idea that you're not f free to have sex until you're free not to have sex, you know. You're not free to have a drink, you know, until you're free not to have a drink, you know. You're not free to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend until you're free not to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend which means that you find the same inner satisfaction, the same inner fulfillment, regardless of which one comes to you. When you've reached that state of, of, of needlessness, you know, then the voice of the guru is true inside. Then the inner voice can be trusted and can be stood upon. Until then, Narada says, the scriptures are to be followed as long as one's life has not become firm. You know, not become firm, meaning shaky, meaning you, you're up if you, you know, if you have that cup of coffee, you're happy, and if you don't have the cup of coffee, you're miserable, and so are the people around you. <laughs> you know, that's infirm. As long as the life's in that state of constant flux based on your environment, based on who you're with, who you get to spend time with, who you don't get to spend time with, you know, what's on the lunch menu for the day or what's on the dinner menu for the day, you know, what car you're driving, <laughs> whether or not you got the job. You know, whether or not your ticket to the Oscars in the mail. You know, these things, these things uh, as long as those become dependencies, then, then you're a machine. You, you're not free. You're being led by a hook in the nose so that you'll be walking down the street and you'll smell pizza and suddenly you have to have pizza. I'm free to get pizza, so you go and buy pizza. You know, then you're walking down the street, and oh, there's a good movie. Ah, oh, I want to. Oh, I gotta go see. Oh, I've got to see that movie. Oh, you go see that movie. One desire after another. You know, and our culture has mastered this. <laughs> this town, in particular, has mastered this art. You know, of of of, of desire. You know, presenting the the kind of one hook after another. You just kind of walk along blissfully. You know, with one good idea after another being handed to you, like, yes, yes, <laughs> must do. But to free ourselves from that, to find that stability of self, to find that contentedness inside that's independent of all of those external things, you know, until we find that place, until we do the work that's necessary to find that place, uh, we, we can't depend on that place. Or not, not we can't depend on the place, we can't depend on our own understanding, on our own idea of truth. You know, it's not purified yet, it's not clear yet, it's not being represented in its truest form to us yet. So how are we going to get out of it? <laughs> how do we fix that? This idea, this idea of, of, of not seeing or being in constant need. The first one is to get practical. I make that the first one <laughs> because I'm an American. You have to get practical. It has to get down where the, where the rubber meets the road. And uh, Vivekananda, again, of course, uh, gives a wonderful paragraph on this that I'm going to read to you. He says, and what are we doing? The son of a poor Brahmin, Ramakrishna, who has sanctified us by his, by his birth, who has raised us by his work and has turned the sympathy of the conquering race towards us by his immortal sayings, what are we doing for him? Truth is not always palatable. Still, there are times when it has to be told. Some of us do understand that his life and teachings are to our gain, but there the matter ends. It is beyond our power even to make an attempt to put these precepts into practice in our own lives, far less to consign our whole body and soul to the huge waves of harmony of jnana and bhakti that Sri Ramakrishna has raised. This play of the Lord those who have understood or are trying to understand, to them we say, what will mere understanding do? The proof of understanding is in work. Will others believe you if it ends only in verbal expressions of assurance or is put forward as a matter of personal faith? Work argues what one feels. Work out what you feel and let the world see. All ideas and feelings coming out of the fullness of the heart are known by their fruits, practical work. Beautiful. <laughs> and one of the most fundamental truths about, about spiritual life. What you are is what you are. It's not what you say you are. It's not what you present yourself to be. 
Otherwise, everybody would go to these dating sites and instantly hook up <laughs> because everybody's stating what they are and you're stating what you're looking for. You've picked that person, naturally it would work. But it doesn't work. Why? Because our understanding of ourself and the state of ourself are often, unfortunately, two very different things. You know? And so this, this, this practicality has to come down to it. We have to, we have to, to take a, a, an honest and hard look at ourselves. You know, truth is not always palatable, Vivekananda says. It's hard to look at yourself and see someone who's selfish. You know, it's, it's hard to look at yourself and, and see someone who, who's, you know, perhaps a bit calloused <laughs> or uncaring or egotistical or, or just downright arrogant, you know. Sometimes, you know, when I catch myself really being dis, literally dismissive of the way somebody feels, you know, about something that I've said. It's, I just, you know, I, I go into this weird, you know, instant, there's, there's not even a discussion inside of like how they feel or what's going on. It's just, it's just a dismission, like dismissive thing, like get over it, you know. And, and I think that more and more in our internet culture, the argument inside is happening less and less. You know, you, you, you read these comments online, and of course it's cliche at this point to talk about them, but the, the, the vitriolic <laughs> hate that people can put into a single sentence sometimes about something so, you know, you know unimportant, you know, as somebody's YouTube video of their dog, you know, it's like <laughs> somebody, somebody can write the most hateful, horrible thing, you're like, it's a video of a dog. Where is that coming from? You know, but the, but this internet idea, where this 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 speed of life that's come to us, where where things are coming at us so fast and so regularly, we're being so diverted so constantly, we're not taking that time. We don't have that time to sit down and process thought, to sit down and process ideas. You know, uh, when when I was a kid, of course, I'm, I'm getting to be old enough to where I can start talking like this, which I'm very happy about. When I was a kid. <laughs> and you took a bus ride to school, you had time to think about the day. You'd sit there on the bus, you might be playing with the other kids or whatnot, but usually you, you'd sit there and you'd think, I've got my homework done and this is gonna happen, that's gonna happen. But nowadays everybody's got, and it's not a bad thing because I've got my own and I love them, these gadgets, you know, that are constant, a constant diversion. You know, I find myself, I go, I went to the doctor's office like two, three weeks ago and I was sitting there, and normally in the doctor's office is, because I just got a cell phone for the first time uh, after I moved here about six months ago. So up until that point, I would sit in the doctor's office, and I would just make all these great imaginary connections with people in the office, you know, just kind of watching and wondering what's wrong with that person, and oh, you know, she, she looks terrible. God, she must really have something awful, or, you know, oh, that kid's so cute. But there would be some sort of constant human you know, uh, uh, identity or uh, empathy going on, you know, as these people would come in. And I would kind of enjoy that and sort of build on that, you know, and, and, uh, and go with that. But I found myself this last time, you know, I was like, oh, cool, I've got a few minutes to pull down my little <laughs> S4. I was like, flip book, yeah, that's an endless supply of news, you know, you just keep going, keep going. And find myself completely, just completely cut off from the environment around me, completely cut off from the other people in the room, and engrossed in things that ultimately, I mean, of course, you know, these things did matter at some level, but uh, for me in that moment, they really ended up having no impact on my life at all. I just wasted time. Whereas creating those bonds of empathy, you know, those, those bonds of looking at other people as humans, looking at each, at each other as, as human, you know, those, those moments are, are becoming less and less and less for us. And uh, it's a dangerous time. It's a dangerous time for that because that, that lowers our depth of thinking. That lowers our depth of, of, of processing so that our idea of self becomes shallower and shallower and shallower. And our ideals only go, you know, so deep. They no longer have the time to trickle down to affect the real way that we think, the real way that we act, you know, so that in that moment of anger, it's the anger that comes out, you know, we don't catch it, you know, because the, the, the underlying thing is actually anger, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't been resolved, we haven't worked through our, through our stuff. So we need to, to, to become very practical in the way that we approach, our, approach the world. Let's not be so distracted, 
by the many things that are available to distract us. Take those times, you know, when, you, when you're sitting on the bus, if anybody sits on the bus here, <laughs> to sit and, and sit on the bus, be on the bus. If you're sitting in traffic, turn off the radio and sit in traffic. Take a notice of the people around you, take a notice of how you feel, take a notice of what you're seeing out the window. Reflect on God in, in relation to all of those things and start looking for lessons. Start looking for hints of this truth, this ideal, you know, that's being presented to us. Start trying to see that oneness. Put yourself into the car next to you in that circumstance. Imagine what, what that person is feeling, what they're thinking, you know. See their frustration, see their hurt, see their anger, you know, see their, their, their uh, you know, uh, need to get to work, <laughs> you know, need to pay their bills. Create that empathy, that oneness. Generate that oneness. So that your idea, Swami Prabhupada, I always have to come up with at least one thing he's told me because he's taught me so much in my life. But this idea that he said, <clears throat> he says, if you're selfish, okay, be selfish. Be as selfish as you can possibly be. But make yourself really huge. <laughs> make yourself really huge so that you can invite as many people into that self as possible. So that, so that selfishness serves as many people as possible. And the way that you do that is through empathy and through sitting and looking at people, identifying with people, empathizing with people, thinking about their life, looking for ways to help them, you know, thinking of how you can be positive toward them for no motive whatsoever, simply because it's you, simply for lo love for love's sake, again in Vivekananda. So we have to go about this purification process. It involves meditating. Ramakrishna, after, after going through that beautiful, very long introduction that I read there, where he talks about the oneness of all things, the, the sweetness of all things to one another, he ends the paragraph by saying this. He says, these ideas are very helpful to men. They are for meditation. For, instan for instance, meditate on the earth. Think of the earth and at the same time know that we have that which is in the earth, that both are the same. Identify the body with the earth, identify the soul with the soul behind it all. Identify the air with the soul that is in the air and that is in me. They are all one, all one manifested in different forms. To realize this unity is the end and the aim of all meditation. Contemplate these things. Contemplate this oneness. Identify this oneness. When you see that person grabbing the last piece of pizza, take joy in the fact that you would have done it. <laughs> you know, it's like enjoy the joy that they're feeling that they got the last piece of pizza instead of feeling the diminished, you know, self of I didn't get the last piece of pizza. But see that oneness. Stand on that oneness. You did get the last piece of pizza. You know, there's, there's many mystical stories, uh, one of them of Ramakrishna and the boat on the Ganges. Everybody was hungry, the boat was, I guess, behind schedule, there, and uh, they were late for lunch, and so everybody was hungry. And, but somebody had brought uh, food, a little plate of lunch, a little plate of food as an offering to Ramakrishna, and so they handed it to Ramakrishna. And, uh, you know, everybody's thinking <laughs> he's going to split it up and give everybody a little bit. And Ramakrishna just sit there, mm, mm, eats, eats the whole thing, you know, until there's not one little speck left on the plate. And uh, at first people were, well, offended, probably. <laughs> but people began to realize they weren't hungry anymore. He gave them an experience that by him being filled, everybody was filled. And uh, that oneness was, was, was shown. There's, there's many examples of like, that, of like that in many of the world's scriptures. And, uh, and so for us to take delight in that, to take delight in the happiness of others, to take delight in the good fortune of others, you know, the, the person that was in front of you that just happened to be the last one that got served that day and you have to come back tomorrow. <laughs> be happy, you know, find that, find that oneness, contemplate that oneness. Vivekananda goes on, he says, the first lesson then is to sit for some time and let the mind run on. The mind is bubbling all the time. It is like that monkey jumping all over the place. Let the monkey jump as much as he can. You simply wait and watch. 
Knowledge is power, says the proverb, and that is true. Until you know what the mind is doing, you cannot control it. Give it the rein. Many hideous thoughts may come into it. Actually, you will be astonished that it was possible for you to think such thoughts. But you will find that each day the mind's vagaries are becoming less and less violent, that each day it is becoming calmer. In the first few months, you will find that the mind will have a great many thoughts. Later, you will find that they have, be have somewhat decreased. And in a few more months, they will be fewer and fewer, until at last the mind will be under perfect control. But we must patiently practice every day. As soon as the steam is turned on, the engine must run. As soon as things are before us, we must perceive. So a man, to prove that he is not a machine, must demonstrate that he is under the control of nothing. This controlling of the mind, and not allowing it to join itself to the centers, is pratyahara. How is this practiced? It is a tremendous work. Not to be done in a day. Only after a patient, continuous struggle for years can we succeed. I've got that bolded <laughs> there. How is this practiced? It is a tremendous work, not to be done in a day, only after a patient, continuous struggle for years can we succeed. We've got to be practical. The very purpose of this life is this realization. For the self to enjoy, to, to enjoy its freedom in the body. Vivekananda writes that. He says that the very, the very point of coming to this planet, of taking a body, is to experience the sweetness of that state. Freedom in the body. Knowing the self and experiencing the self through this maya. You know, Jivan Mukta, he calls it. That is the point of this life. And how is it practiced? How, it is, it, how is it attained? Through tremendous work. So we've got a new year ahead. <laughs> we've got a new year ahead. Many of us are tired. Many of us are growing older. <laughs> Many of us have, you know, for whatever reason, we've, we've just become comfortable. We've kind of sat back. We've perhaps been meditating for a few years, perhaps have started to enjoy a little bit of those, the, that peace of mind. But it's a new year a new year for us to go higher and to take on a tremendous work that's not to be done in a day but through a continuous struggle as we continue forward in this process to take heart but to be honest truth is not always palatable we're not going to coast into this realization we're not going to skip in in a sundress and think and arrive <laughs> I know the truth now it's finished you know, it's a tremendous work. And every one of us in here owes it to ourselves and to the world around us to do that tremendous work. That tremendous work to be the greatest lovers of mankind. To be visionaries who see and act on the oneness we understand in each other. To have that love and that compassion. <clears throat> Hafiz writes in a poem, the Beloved's name is a mystical weave and pattern, a hidden sieve of effulgence we need to pass through thousands of times. For my constant remembrance of the friend, all I now say is safe to drink. For this purification to happen, you know, as we contemplate the truth of this oneness, as the Master says, or as we see the oneness and the sweetness of the world and the support of one another and being that, being that positive influence in the people around us, Continually passing the name of the Beloved through our mind is a sieve that will remove all of the impurities and will prevent it from, from, from changing into ego, will prevent it from becoming a poison that creates that smugness, self-righteousness of misguided religion. Keeping the name, the blissful name of whatever your ideal is, the sweet name of Jesus, the sweet name of Ramakrishna or Holy Mother or Buddha, or no name at all, just Om, you know. To take that and to just run that through the mind, to keep that constant balance, that constant perspective of oneness, to keep it alive 
so that all that you have to say is safe to drink for those around you. We have to long for this. Sister Christine wrote a beautiful paragraph uh, that I stumbled upon this week when she was writing about Swamiji in her reminiscences. She says, it is needless to repeat the formal teaching, the great central idea. These one can read for himself. But there was something else. There was an influence, an atmosphere charged with the desire to escape from bondage. Call it what you will. That can never be put into words and yet was more powerful than any of the words. It was this which made us realize that we were blessed beyond words. To hear Vivekananda say, this indecent clinging to life drew aside the curtain for us into a region beyond life and death and planted in our heart the desire for that glorious freedom. We saw a soul struggling to escape the meshes of Maya one to whom the body was an intolerable bondage, not only a limitation, but a degrading humiliation. Azad, Azad, the free, he cried, pacing up and down like a caged lion, yes, like a lion in a cage, who found the bars were not of iron, but of bamboo. Let us not be caught this time, would be his refrain another day. So many times Maya has caught us. So many times we have exchanged our freedom for sugar dolls which melt when the water touched them. Let us not be caught this time. So in us was planted the great desire for freedom. Two of the three requisites we already had, a human body and a teacher, and now he was giving us the third, the desire to be free. <laughs> I love it when a scripture can actually take you, you know, into the presence of one of the, one of these holy people. This idea, you know, this, this regeneration, just that in, that infusion that you sometimes need, you know, that encouragement, that that drive to rise up, to not be lazy, to not be content with with mediocrity, you know, not to settle for misery and happiness in 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 sequential portions, you know, to not, to, not, to not be content with just disconnecting, with checking out and being unaffected, you know, but to find that encouragement in these holy peoples to stay fully engaged so that you hurt with those who are hurting, you know, so that you are compelled to care for those who need to be cared for, so that you feel compelled to listen to those who need to be listened to. You know, so that you feel compelled to put out that extra bit to remember a birthday. <laughs> you know, to to remember somebody was was going to a doctor and to just call them up out of the blue and ask him how it went, or to, you know, this week I had a great experience at, at, in this monastery. You know, I, I'm I'm new to this monastery. I've only been here six months. I'll be saying I'm new probably for the rest of my life, but for six months now I've been new. But this week I had a particularly touching experience in that, uh, you know, I had a, a terrible out of this flu and it took out about 10 of us this week in a very rapid succession and so I was in my room I, I, and I somehow managed to get a double dose of it I, I went down for twice as long as anyone else <laughs> I found a new position for, 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 doing, uh, for doing my japa actually <laughs> involved a bathroom floor and kind of this position <laughs> I knew I was sick I was like oh boy but I spent almost six days just staying in my room because I just, well, I didn't want to go anywhere else, frankly, and I didn't want to pass this thing on to anybody else. But in those six days, I had a constant flow of the brothers coming to my door with a bowl of ginger soup, with a cup of tea, with a bottle of Gatorade, you know, with a, with a, you know, a, a nobody brought a cookie, but a pill. <laughs> <laughs> you know some 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 uh, medicine for for stomach medicines, but it was just a constant flow at least four or five six times a day you know somebody just knocking just a little knock on the door coming in how are you doing you doing okay do you need anything can I get you some food do you need some more medicine do you need Kleenex and I was touched by that because it was natural 
and I knew that was n there was nobody in the background saying, "Okay, you uh, go check on uh, Chid Brahm over in the room, you know, see what he needs." That this was coming out of the fullness of the heart that what that Vivekananda was talking about, and I found a deeper appreciation and a value for for the seeds of this enlightenment that are in this place, in this in this group of people here. And uh, I found a, a great deal of encouragement and uh, an inspiration to add to that and to become a part of that heart. And, uh, you know, in our prayer for love between one another this morning, that's exactly where, what, what we were aiming for in that idea. To wrap this, to wrap this up, to, to put a beautiful bow on the end of this package, I want to read something that was read at the breakfast table this morning which I think is, is one of the most important things in, in our struggle, <laughs> as, as Vivekananda puts it, this tremendous work not to be done in a day, but only after patient, continuous struggle. This is in Spiritual Treasures, the letters of Swami Turiyananda, and he's writing to a gentleman by the name of Bihari Babu, one of those delightful Indian names. He said, I was so happy reading your letter, and again I became sad noticing your old self-deprecating mood. You are a child of the Divine Mother. Why do you consider yourself so worthless? Please shun this negative feeling completely. The Master taught us to repeat, I chant God's name, why should I worry? Truly, I feel pain when I hear your self-reproaching attitude. We have heard from the Master that this is an obstacle to spiritual progress. Knowing your strong relationship with God, you have to move toward him. Never forget that you are his child. Human relationships are casual and momentary, but this relationship with the Lord, it is eternal. The ever-free Atman takes a human birth in order to taste the bliss of liberation in life and not for the fulfillment of any worldly desires. I can hardly convey to you what a wonderful joy and light dawned on me when I first read this verse of Shankara. Then the purpose of life shined forth before me and all problems were solved automatically. I realized that the purpose of human birth is nothing but tasting the bliss of Jivan Mukti or freedom while being alive. Truly there is no reason for the ever free Atman to assume a human body except that it likes to enjoy the freedom of being in that body. You are that ever-free Atman. Your expression of self-pity does not befit you. No doubt it is difficult to look directly into the sun, but it is easy to look at it ref the, the reflected sun. Likewise, it may be difficult to realize the existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute, as I am Brahman, but one can definitely identify oneself with him as I am his child or a part of him. One should not think oneself separate from God. It is not beneficial. Whatever I may be, I belong to him and to none else. A son may be unworthy, but he is still a son. There is a song of Ramprasad, good or bad, whatever I may be, you know everything. But does a mother discard her son because he is bad? Whether you are good or bad, you are a child of the Divine Mother. There is no doubt about it. With love and best wishes, Swami Turiyananda.
closing chant, I'm going to read another poem from Hafiz called Old Sweet Beggar. This path to God made me such an old sweet beggar. I was starving until one night my love tricked God himself to fall into my bowl. Now Hafiz is infinitely rich, while all I ever want to do is keep emptying out my emerald-filled pockets upon this tear-stained world.